Thank you so much for joining me today. I am Dr. Joshua Kolawale from Valdemar's Intelligence. Today, I'm going to be taking you through the transforming culture. I am a global transformational leadership trainer, and I would like you to sit tight, sit diligently, get a notepad, an iPad, or something to jot down. Before I go ahead, let me break down this topic for us so that we can um, flow into it effectively. We have the word transforming and we also have the word culture. On a general basis, I would love you to see culture from personal. I would love you to see it from organizational. Now, uh, for organizational, remember, this will be made of many teams, right? And then I would love you to see it from societal, societal point of view. I would also make you, uh, I would love you to notice that culture also evolved through three different stages. There is the general culture that evolves into social culture that evolves into transforming culture. For the word transforming, it is actually representing the word transformation. And that means I am going to have to explain to you what exactly transformation is. The ability to move from a level to a different level, achieving different forms of outcomes. I generally love to say it this way, that arithmetically you can move, maybe let's say your finances from a level A to a level B, a level 1 to a level 2 to a level 3. You can also move it from a level 2 and jump to a level 20. That leaping in your mindset that generates massive results is the basic difference between change and transformation. So you can keep changing, but you can also transform and turn yourself completely into a different thing. Um, let me exit this page and let's go ahead. John Cotter was the one who brought the idea that the systems, the structure we have built for a while is not able to sustain the pace at which the world is changing. We know a lot of things have changed technologically between the last 20 years. Now we are in a world of chat GPT, the, the, the open AI. So you understand that the world is really, really hyper-connecting on a technological basis. We also have the COVID-19. We have the climate changes. A lot of integrating changes that are happening together in a simple or a single ecosystem. So what do you expect? You need to build a structure that would help you to transform yourself. Otherwise, if you want to wait on just the marginal changes that happen over a lifetime, trust me, it would take 10 lifetimes for some of you to leap across. So what I would advise is, why not set up yourself on a lifestyle that sees transformation as the goal? And let's leverage on our teaching today so that you can learn the concept of change and the concept of transformation. By change, I mean, and I, I, I want to teach a little bit. By change, I mean you're doing something in a different way, but it is within an existing culture. Please take a note of that. So you can change your processes, change a lot of things around you, but you're still within the same cultural framework. And we will talk about the element of culture. As long as you're within the same framework of, of culture, of the same culture, you will generate results, but it will still be within that same cultural limitation. You will generate some result. However, transformation is that you are actually able to introduce and reinforce a completely new mind capacity, new culture. So, if you start at a level this way, if this is a culture A, you're actually able to move yourself to a different culture, culture B. 
until you are able to achieve that, you will not be able to transform yourself completely. You will not be able to generate massive results. You will not be able to generate huge performance outcome. And hence, you will not be able to generate great transformation. Transformation requires leaping in mindset and jumping on the next curve of innovation. You will need to think through and break through in, your, in, in, in the way you think, in the way you learn, in the way you confront life or you integrate into the world system. And that is the difference between uh, change and transformation. Uh, I hope you're following me. If you are not jotting down, please, at this point, I would love you to get a notepad, an iPad or something and start putting things down. I want to talk about a transforming system, but I want to help you to understand this concept of transformation deeply. Transformation is a complete change in the quality of outcomes. I, I love this because I'm starting with the outcome and the standard of living of a people. This is crucial because ultimately what would change is the quality of your life and the standard of your life. And this happens always through well-defined processes. By the time you sit these people who have transformed their system down, if you sit me down, I can tell you the meticulous thing I did from a level to a level to a level. And I can explain to you how you can put yourself on the same pathway at personal level to generate different results. So this causes possible transitions and quantum leaps in five classic things. And I'm going to break down these five things. The first thing is maturity. The maturity of the mind of the people involved. I talk about maturity this way so that it will be easy for you to, to grapple. You see, by the time the way you learn starts changing, how you learn and what you learn, the quality of what you learn, determines the transformational journey you're going to be upon. Learning comes in two ways. People talk about structured and non-structured learning. Non-structured learning. Both structured and non-structured, if integrated properly and in a disciplined way, it will generate magnificent results. But it's not only learning that determines maturity, the way you think. I need your thinking to evolve. I need it to move from a social level of thinking to a transforming level of thinking. That is all about performance outcomes. The way you see things. So the way you see things, because by the time you see well, what would happen is that you will see more important things and you will see things that are just a distraction and you'll be able to separate them. And the way you hear, the way you listen, the quality of how you listen will change when you're tagged as a matured person. Another critical factor, apart from the way you learn, the way you think, the way you see, and the way you hear, this is the most important of them, the way you speak. The quality of words that comes out of your mouth. We used to say it this way. We say, once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. So when, when you start talking, people already can analyze and categorize you. So, look, these are five things that defines a matured mind. So when I say the quality of outcomes and the standard of living of a people would change, and I said the first classic thing you would notice is the maturity of the minds of those people. Number one, what they start learning, how they think, what they see, what they hear. So the two of us can engage in a simple discussion. And I would internalize something differently and you would actually hear completely different thing. It's a function of the maturity of our mind. The second thing is now the capability. That is categorized for me in two ways. Because ultimately it comes to the design you are able to build and the implementation you are able to do. For the design, I would say the design of the intervention you can craft out. 
and implementation comes with the execution, the strategic execution. And that is the way where your design, the point where your design interacts with the real world. This is the capability we're talking about. So, number two that would happen is that the capability of these people will change. They will have access to better tools. They will have access to better things that would open up bigger opportunities for them. The third thing is the value you will create. By value, I mean the concept of multiplying quality by quantity and dividing it by cost. And it's easier to quickly think this cost is finances alone. No, it isn't. It could be finance, it could be time, it could be material. In fact, it could be that you lose a team member. It could be team member. That may be the cost. And so you need to understand that whatever goal you achieve, the value is a function of what is it's a function of what you gain in the process divided by what you are had to lose to gain that thing. So when we talk about quality and we talk about quantity, you know it's easy for us to say Henry Ford came out with a, an excellent car in, in, in his generation and he was able to put a system in place to scale the production. So in anything you do, apart from targeting the excellent level of the feature, you must also think about the capacity to scale that thing to massively produce. When you're able to scale to in numbers, then your value keeps rising. So what happens to uh, someone that has transformed themselves is they are able to scale in value. So you're able to get more people to believe in you. You're able to get more qualitative people to believe in you. This determines the value you will be able to earn and the value you're also giving to the world. Now the third thing is uniqueness. I love to explain uniqueness this way. You see, whenever you're doing anything, we all start from the general level. From the general level, you rise on to what we call operational excellence. This is the general level. We rise to what we call operational excellence. By the time you walk how to work others in doing this thing, you get to the point of strategic differentiation. That is the point of uniqueness. That is the point where people rise above the general populace, move even beyond the evolving mind, and get into the point of strategic uh, differentiation. I want you to note something. That ultimately, the noble impact that you make on your social system, either directly or indirectly, is a crucial part of the transforming system. Is a crucial part of the concept of transformation. So, I am glad that you're following me today. Please follow me to the end of this lecture because you're going to have to gain a lot. Culture is the accumulation of learned strategies we use to survive and thrive over time. This is Kelvin Cross's definition of personal level culture. And remember when we started, I said we're going to observe it in, across three different ways. Personal, organizational, and societal. And why do I want you to see it across those three different ways? This is the reason. Look, it is the integration... Oh, sorry. It is the integration of the personal culture. It's the integration of the personal culture of all team members that becomes the organizational culture. When you integrate all the organization in the society and the people together, the integration of all these also births what we call the societal, societal culture. So, this thing starts from personal level. If we get it right to get more transformed people, more transformed people, it would help both the society and help the organizations within that society. I once spoke about the living mind. And I said, as a leader in any organization, you need to ask your team members, how many living minds are in this organization? How many living minds are in this organization? The reason why you need to ask that question is that these transformed minds are living minds. They bring new passion. 
they bring new vision they bring new energy or what we call drive or what you call motivation they bring it to the team and they help to birth new purposes when you have the integration of these things in the place of wisdom where wisdom and love is established trust me it's only a matter of time you will generate massive outcome so you need people who are transformed in their thinking at personal level on your team in your organization i heard uh, a story that a coach was sitting down and they told him two teams are going to play in this final which team will win this match and the coach or the man smiled and said it's team b that is going to win and someone said oh after the match someone said how did you know team b was going to win he said look at it analyze the two players this one as a team b at the stronger bench stand that is those on the reserve are actually stronger in team b compared to those on the reserve for team a and any team that has stronger reserve it shows that even apart from the 11 on the field of play and i'm talking about game of soccer now apart from the 11 on the field of play if you have a stronger reserve team you're going to generate more outcome and what simply happened in the match when the going got tough you know only the tough keeps going it was a substitute player from the team b's bench that came in and changed the dynamics of the game got them the single goal and they won the match so it just simply explained the concept that when you have living minds transformed minds on your team so this journey of culture starts from personal level that is my emphasis if we're able to get it right at personal level societally organizationally we will build a great culture thank you for following me on that uh, please stay tuned so the next uh, phase i would love to talk about is culture at organizational and societal level a strong organizational culture is in, isn't just a choice it's a strategic advantage if you're able to build organization uh, with a stronger culture you would see it it would generate a strategic opportunity for you because i just spoke about uh, living minds and i told you if you're able to build enough living minds on your team at organizational level if you're able to build living minds on your team it's going to generate enough uh, results for you So, it's a strategic advantage for you if you are able to generate enough a uh, living mind. The culture of an organization comprises of its artifacts, espoused beliefs and values, as well as its underlying assumptions, which can be learned and can also influence response to change and how business is conducted. Now, in an organization, and this definition came from uh, Oluwa Bukola Dokas Kolawoli, um, she's also with us at Valdemar's Intelligence. Uh, and I told you, you must have a living mind on your team. If you look at this definition, it speaks to the artifact, it speaks to the beliefs, the values, the underlying assumptions. It also made us understand that these things can be learned and it speaks to how it can influence response to change. I would like you to also compare this definition with the second one, which is also from the same person. This is like an initial draft. This is like a final draft. An organizational, organization's culture comprises of its values and beliefs, which can impact change. It can impact the employees, the mission and the vision, and even the overall conduct of the business. Integrating these two definitions together, you would see one critical thing it starts from the values so the values at personal level influences organizational level influences societal level if those values are right then the results that will happen in the organization 
will be of right start. So I need you to understand that this concept of culture, as we keep breaking it down, it's actually crucial to, to the growth of organization and even to the quality of results an organization will generate. You know they used to say that there are really no third world nation. There are only third world minds. Because there are people in the first world nation that are actually running on a third world mind. And there are people in the third world nation, the so-called third world nations, that are actually running with a first world mind. And because of that, they generate transformational results in their world. So, the environment is critical, but not totally about the environment. It's the quality of transformation in the minds. At individual level, when scaled integrally, then becomes the quality or the of character of the citizenry of an organization or a nation, as the case may be. So, uh, taking this and on understanding that, let's move to the next uh, slide. The strongest force in an organization isn't the vision or the strategy. You know, they, they say it's a popular saying uh, that when, when a people lack vision, they ultimately perish. But when vision also lack people, don't forget, the vision too will perish. So it's a win-win it's a for vision and people. But the concept of culture is a concept that rests on the people. And that is why it's a strategic thing that... Uh, I listened to a video earlier today. Uh, the speaker uh, spoke to the fact that the leader in an organization needs to relate at individual level with everyone, the workforce, the vendor, everyone. And you must know what drives them. You must understand the kind of culture. In fact, it went as deep as saying, analyze who they are, understand their background culture, and work with them on how you can transform them to a better culture. So because of this, it is important for us to know and to align with the words of Robert Kina that culture is what holds all the components together. Even though it starts at individual level, it's integrated together uh, as a whole. Culture determines the prevalent attitude and it's the collage of spoken and unspoken uh, messages on organization. I need you to know that uh, culture can be healthy and it can be unhealthy. And you see, we all know that once something is unhealthy, it breeds it, it, it spreads like cancer. Imagine when you have tomatoes in a basket. If one of them get, got, uh, gets spoiled, what happens to the others? It's only a matter of time. It keeps spreading rapidly. One thing you need to know is that you need to nip a, an unhealthy culture at, at its board. You need to make sure that you are intentional about creating healthy culture in the organization. I explained in my previous class that culture is the soul of an organization. And don't forget, in the concept of the man where soul is being used, soul is the interconnection between the physical body, which operates here on this planet, and the spirit of a man we possibly never sees this planet. But there is an interconnection that goes from here and that comes back from here. This gathers information from this physical world and feeds the spirit through the soul. The degree of transformation of this soul determines what comes from here and is fed to the spirit of the man. And that's why they can call two of us to come and analyze a scenario. And some people will come back with an excellent report. And some other, many, many people will come back with a bad report. It's simply because of what has been fed into the spirit over time. When a spirit gets an information, he interprets it based on the amount of amplification or depression that happens from this soul. 
And when the spirit is also to respond, it comes back the same way. If the soul is a transformed soul, a better result comes back, which determines the joy, the quality of words, the quality of thinking, the quality of vision that would be given back to this real world. So when you say someone's faith is low, someone's strength is low, it's very simple. This soul is what is responsible for either augmenting that or dampening it. So when we say the culture is the soul uh, of, of an organization, then it stands to reason. So I please stay with me and let's keep going. Vision and strategy usually focuses on products, services, and outcomes, but culture focuses on the people. I explained that, and they are the most important, the most valuable asset uh, of the organization. Culture eats up strategy for launch. This is a popular saying uh, in, in management world. It, it derails focus, and it's the reason why organization is not where it should be. Someone explains it that, if an organization is supposed to be at a point in 100, and it's actually currently in its 60s, that difference is the calculation of the health, uh, the lack or the lack of health of the organization. So, you need to understand that culture is the place in which vision and strategy is set. Culture can be inspiring, it can be accepting, and it can be toxic. And you need to know how to spot that kind of thing in any society where you are. So, you need to learn how to spot that. But before you know how to spot it, you must first know what is good so that it's easy for you to identify what is not. And that's why I broke it down into ethical culture, social culture, the leadership culture, and the technological and internet environment culture. The ethical culture speaks to the dedication to work, the commitment to values and principles for achieving results. It talks about moral integrity. It talks about making sound judgment. It talks about defining what is good and what is bad. You must have a stand. Because if you do not stand for something, you will fall for anything. So there has to be clearly defined boundaries. The boundaries with which we will do business in any terrain. That once the rule is going to cross this line, then we are not going to do business again. At personal level, at organizational level, and even in societies that seek transformation. Social culture talks about the formal and informal support structure in our environment. It speaks to the events and the services and how you touch your community. At an individual level, I do this teaching and I touch my community with this. If you integrate 10 of me together in an organization and we keep doing excellent work and we keep touching our community by giving excellent service to our community, that is a way of touching our community. We could also have corporate social responsibility where we actually give back to our community. But the leadership structure is also very crucial because without the leadership structure, the organization, the person, the, the society is going to crumble in every human scenario. Every major feat has a leader in them. In fact, the people would generally say, let's get together a leader. Who is going to lead us? Have you been in any society before that is leaderless? It's a real system. And in fact, if you actually analyze it properly, someone is actually taking the lead. You only may not know. So, but the culture demonstrated in that environment is based on the core values, the vision, the mission, and more importantly, the speed of execution in that environment. I need you to know these four things. Of course, technology is now a crucial part of our game. Look at the platform I'm using to teach. You are possibly also listening to me on a certain platform built up by technology. You have access to all these things through technology. Technology comes with elegance, excitement, and a lot of technological support. One, to make you get things faster, cheaper, easier, and sometimes um, it speed things up. Let's um, get to... the elements of culture. 
Because you need to understand the elements of culture for you to be able to pick what are those things that are really not good in a culture. These are five classical elements of a culture. We talk about the words, the statements, the gestures, and the pictures. We talk about, for symbols, we talk about the graphics, the logo. If you talk about the graphics, these are the things that can be perceived, the symbols, the things people can actually see. You see, there's something we say in leadership that you can tell people many things but what they see themselves what 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 the convictions they have about the society the system the organization the person is what goes a long way so we say generally that about about 70 to 90 percent of communication is non-verbal you might think you're actually communicating what in your own thinking is the truth but the idea is what people hear is actually the picture the images everything you have put together is what determines what people hear and what people see so you have to think through all the scenarios and don't forget the norms which is the standard of practice and the expectation of behavior in a society we also have the values, which is made up of the statement of purpose. Why do we exist? And you know, we say when the why is strong enough, we figure out the how. The why, the vision, the mission, the mantras, and even the motto of the organization. All these things are crucial. Purpose, the values, which determines the boundary that protects the vision. So the vision is within this boundary. The mission is how we're going to get this done. The mantras and the motto are what we re-echo in the society. You know, we say this is how we do things here. But people talk about how we do those things. How they talk about those things is what determines the culture in the organization. Then everything comes with a the history. There's history, there are pictures, there's... Um, there are videos, old materials, clothing, and technological adaptation. So, why did I have to mention all these artifacts? The reason is that people want to know where the organization is coming from, how they have evolved over time. Even you as a person, people want to listen to your story. They want to know where you have, where you're coming from, how you have gotten to where you are, and all this comes together to tell us about your history. This history is crucial for us to know because it helps us to analyze your current and even your future predispositions. Because we're talking about culture, I said, if the air is clean and healthy, people thrive and the organization succeed. But once the air becomes toxic, energy starts subsiding. Once passion starts going down, creativity starts lagging. Conflict multiply. Now, the challenge with this conflict is that it, it manifests in two ways. There can be implosion and there can be explosion. When people are implosive, they are actually bitter, but they do not show physical signs. They can still even be psychophants, still singing your praises, but they are already bitter within them. And this is dangerous because it, it births stuff like envy, all these evil forms of jealousy and, 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 and those spectrum. They can self-sabotage the organization. They don't care what they do as long as they get back at the organization just because they feel bitter. These kind of people are more dangerous because they still stick closer to you. There is the explosion. These ones become confrontational. By the time someone who is implosive becomes confrontational, of course, they become more dangerous. We know that. But some people generally don't have the capacity or the time for implosion. They get confrontational from the word go. And this 
kind of conflict leads to production decline. And that is why building a clean air of accountability, transparency in an organization, open communication is critical. You will see very soon. Please just stay tuned. And let's keep going. We're almost getting there. I need you to just take it in gently. That's why I'm taking my time to analyze and to explain. The ingredient of an unhealthy culture, there's the lack of communication and accountability. You will see in the environment, is an environment driven by fear, super controlled environment. No one truly has freedom. You have the chances of hearing a no, a high chance of hearing a no, when you bring an initiative up because it's driven by fear. There's lack of leadership development, poor listening skills, lack of continuous learning. Once you notice a society that is not given to continuous training, continuous learning, it's a society that seeks to kill the mind so that they can control the mind. You know it's been said, you can rule ignorance. You can manipulate the people when they are uneducated. When you get into a society, an environment where there are silos, caucuses, people selling themselves out, you start hearing rumors, then you know something is obviously wrong. The culture there is unhealthy. Now, this is the king of the evil here. They start making decisions slowly. Don't forget we said creativity will lag. Once creativity lags, what will happen is, you know, energy has subsided. Creativity is lagging. What will happen is decisions are made slowly. And that's when you come with initiative, you come passionately. They will tell you, just calm down. That's not the way we do things yet. It's simply because creativity is lagging. And trust me, you have higher resistance in such unhealthy culture. Very high resistance to change. In fact, some of them will get confrontational when you bring transformative ideas and ideals on board. Please stay with me. We're getting closer to the end of the lecture, but I need you to keep jotting down, please. I tell people when you enter into an organization or even when you meet a new friend or when you are in a society, a different society, there are four classic questions you should ask and you have to be sincere with yourself because the truth is confrontational. The first thing you must ask is, can I sense strong signs of integrity in this society? What they are communicating, how they are doing things, do they align? What I am finding out and what they are saying, do they align? Are they integral? Are they one? When I see discrepancy in what they say in their history, then I start sensing that this culture is not a culture of integrity. And that's the first major signal for you to know that a culture is unhealthy. The second thing is that do they have the capability to deliver value? Are they competent? Now there's a place of when people are not competent and you can see the effort to become competent. And they're driving themselves, they're a learning mind, integrating, collaborating, doing everything to reevaluate themselves to get better. That is a sign of someone generating higher capability to deliver better value. But when you see a society that is complacent, a society that lacks energy towards learning, towards development of their capacity, then you know that that culture is also unhealthy. Now you have two points. The third point is a society that lacks good intention. Now this is tricky because we all want short-term gains. Don't we all? But a truly healthy culture is a culture that drives longer-term gain. 
Now, some of you will say, no, I want some short-term wins. I hear you. But we must not get the short-term wins at the expense of long-term transformational change. Because the whole essence of transforming culture, you would soon see as I wrap up, is that transforming culture must be a culture that builds transgenerationally. They build on rocks, not on sand. So because of that, it's good to have some short-term wins, but they must be minimized and they must not be sacrificed, as in, it must not cause us to sacrifice the longer-term gain. So compassion, this is a typical example. An advanced nation comes to a younger nation and says, I'll give you grants. And they keep pumping grants and support. When the younger nation has crisis, like let's say COVID-19 or an outbreak, the nation truly needs short-term wins. They need to get out of the acute phase of the infection. They need to get out of the acute disaster, like an earthquake or something. At that point, they need quick wins to rescue lives. But you see, upon rescuing life, you do not continue to give people piecemeal. Instead of giving them fish, you need to train them to build system to generate fishes and mass themselves. So because of that, you help people on a short term, but you build their capacity to flow into a longer term. That is genuine compassion. Any other system that seeks to keep people on a short term win, then becomes a controlling system and seeks to enslave the man. And that's no longer compassion. The third part of it is the ability to deliver results and inspire trust. You see, there's one key concept of uh, transformation. We call it inspirational motivation. It's so crucial that leaders build culture that is inspiring, that drives people to want to do more, that makes people believe in the capacity of the future to turn things around for both the organization and for themselves. Please stay with me as we keep going. Now I want to talk to you more about the concept of transforming culture. And I need you to listen. We're just about three slides away from the end. And these are crucial points. This is the point that distinguishes the, the, the good from the great. So if you are listening to this point, you're good. But this is the point where the great minds are made. Transforming culture is the way of life of a people, which drives the learning. And I'm, you see, I'm meticulous about this. Because I understand the place of learning. I understand the significance of learning properly. Because how you learn and what you learn every day matters. Of course, we can talk about the why later. But how and what is crucial to your transformation. How you think and what you think about. Are you thinking about transformative ideas? Are you looking and analyzing, problem solving, brainstorming? How you design. These things are integrated. Learning, thinking, they integrate together to determine the kind of designing you will bring. They also determine the kind of collaboration you would have. The people you will collaborate with. When you integrate these two together, it would help to determine the kind of actions you would take. The kind of actions you would take determines the kind of evaluation structure you put in place. The integration of this action and evaluation determines the kind of impact. So I have met many a, a people talk about generating low impact in their life. I tell them this is not where the problem is. I tell them, come back to this point. How do you learn? How do you think? What do you learn? What do you think about? Because this will determine how you see life. What you hear from life. It will determine a lot of things. And that interpretation and perspective will go a long way to determine the kind of people you will collaborate with. The kind of designs you will put for your life, roadmaps, blueprints, the kind of discipline structure you will draft for yourself, it will go a long way to determine the people you will collaborate with and the actions you will take. 
So this determines ultimately how you generate completely new mind capacities, attitude, performance, capability, and outcome. Don't forget, it starts from the mind. It starts from the mind. Transforming culture will be reviewed under these four areas. The first area is the just culture. The second area is the culture of excellence. The third area is the resilient culture. And the fourth is the strategic culture. And please join me. Oh. I decide to explain this, uh, to, to open this up uh, in, on the slide. When we talk about a just culture, it's a culture that embraces people and believes that errors are made at system level, not at individual level. And because errors are made at system level, it's a blame-free culture. However, it is a culture that prevents at-risk behavior. It's a culture that prevents reckless behavior. I'll give you an example. And it's a culture that prevents sabotaging behavior. What is at risk behavior? I won't just give practical examples so it's easier for you to understand. You're a student. You don't attend classes. You're already at risk. There's no two way about it. By the time you start missing assignments, deadlines for submission of assignments, that's reckless. The day you miss an exam, that's sabotaging. I hope that's simple enough. Another example that comes to mind easily is alcohol intake and driving a car. By the time you start taking alcohol, maybe alone, seated, you're fine, but it's a risk. Immediately you get into the vehicle and you start driving. That's a reckless behavior. That is a reckless behavior. And if you continue to drive over a long period of time, it's only a matter of time. It will lead to sabotaging behavior. You will sabotage someone on the road if you don't self-sabotage yourself. Sorry, self-sabotage. So I, I just took my time to explain that a little bit so that anytime you're doing something, you should be asking yourself, is this an at-risk behavior? Am I already reckless or sabotaging? When you have a staff in an organization that comes late, that's an at-risk person. Over time, the person is going to graduate into some recklessness and they're going to sabotage the organization. It's only a matter of time if you allow it to grow. So a just culture is a culture that is though blame-free, Pursues fairness and systems thinking, but prevents these kinds of behavior. They put systems and structures in place to support people who are still doing at risk to prevent them from going into reckless, let alone getting into sabotaging behavior. It's a system that is transparent, open, and accountable. It allocates resources properly and collaborates. The culture of excellence is a culture that embraces learning and training. It's a thinking and a problem-solving culture. It's a culture that is driven by improvement. But we have to be careful about this improvement. Don't forget, there are genuine improvements which are real growth. And there are inflammatory growth too. That people can manipulate results, but they are not based on fine principles. So, improvement must be based on systems where you have adequate structures, processes in place to generate such outcome. It's a system that I love researching and innovation. It's a system that is given to management and evaluation. The resilient culture. This is a crucial culture. Constantly evolving, constantly scanning, constantly adapting, and it's resilient in nature. You see organizations that fail to scan their environment. 
would soon become history. Of course, by the principles of adaptation, even in biology, every organism is expected to adapt to its, to its environment. If you fail to adapt to your environment, then you become extinct. COVID-19 taught us why organizations need to be more resilient in their nature. They must build resilience into their structure. You must think ahead, you must simulate crisis, and you must deal with them like you're really, truly in crisis scenario. And that is the thinking, the bat, that strengthens the agile manifesto. It's also the thinking that, stre that strengthens the lean movement. Because if you're lean, agile in your thinking, the leanness will help you conserve enough resources to build a foundational structure. The agile will keep you, keep you going at a momentum that would help you over time that even when you hit crisis, you will still be driving at some speed. All right. Any society you are, any organization you are that does not play the game of thinking, differentiation, infinite game, and is not a long-term planning organization, is running on an unhealthy structure. So if you want to have transforming culture at personal level, let's run through it. You are a person that is fair, you build system, you run your life transparently and you're accountable, you allocate your resource properly and you collaborate with the right people. You have right sponsors, you have right mentors. You must be someone given to learning and training yourself. Thinking, improvement driven, researching, innovating. You must be constantly evolving, checking your environment. You must also be someone who is given to running things via right guiding principles. You're thinking about established operational excellence. Don't forget I spoke about operational excellence the other time. You start generally, you rise to operational excellence, and then you rise to strategic differentiation. That is how organizations move. So all these speaks to um, all this speaks to this last slide. This last slide makes us understand that the value created by an excellent culture helps to improve the quality of staff, quality of customer, quality of vendor, quality of relationship the organization has. It also speaks to the fact that economically, financially, you keep expanding your results. One thing that helps me more when I'm thinking and talking to organizational leaders about transforming culture is this point. The uniqueness, the reputation, and the brand that is built. You see, the monetary value of this concept the true monetary value cannot be estimated the brand of an organization is what makes a man crosses seven rivers seven oceans to come and pick your product even at the in the midst of other product can i shock you people can cross many pepsis just to pick coca-cola because of the brand and people can cross many other drinks just to pick Pepsi as well. I'm only saying once the brand ideation and representation resonates with a person, people will cross several things to come and pick that. Many people believe in us at Valdemar's Intelligence simply because of the brand that we have created over time. And they know we will deliver to our word. So this brand uniqueness reputation is crucial. And I tell people, you build in two realms. You build physically, for organization, for person, and you build conceptually. Every human at personal level, you are existing physically, the things they can see on you. But what they also cannot see is the conceptual image of you that someone has. And this is crucial 
to determine if they will promote you in the organization because when they are discussing you in that boardroom, it's the conceptual image that will come to be. Conceptual image of organization is the brand ideation of that organization in the minds of people. The same thing with the society. When they mention Africa, some brand representation comes to people's mind. I can narrow it down to nations in Africa. But once they mention Africa as the only brand idea comes. When they mention America, a brand ideation also comes. When they mention Europe, a brand ideation comes. But I can separate countries in Europe and say Germany. I can say Spain. And different brand ideas still comes. So what I'm saying is that we deal with people conceptually because it determines the kind of trust, the kind of things we give. Even resources are allocated to people conceptually. The conceptualization of the capacity of a person determines what level of trust, confidence we would have in that person. So this is critical. You must understand that people see you physically. And that is why it's good to appear well. It's good to be sound in your thinking and in your speaking. But it's also more importantly that you have solid character, solid competence, and you're true to your word. You're diligent. That would help people go away with a sound conceptual image of you. So building excellent culture brings great value to the organization or to even you as a person. The quality of your friends will change. So if you want the quality of your people you roll with, your friends to change, change the culture in which you're existing. Not try to make changes within that culture. Change the culture. The uniqueness and the reputation of your brand will rise. And once that rise, your brand strength will attract new customers, new vendors, new friends, and it will help you to retain more of the hold. So you need to work on the culture you build because it affects your brand strength. The measure of pride in being part of a working system and building up people is critical. Organizations that build people, that make people great, retain more people. And people have the pride of working with them. And ultimately, the positive impact that you build on your community, on your nation, and on your world. That is the goal of an excellent culture. I would admonish you today, work on the transformation of the culture in which you are existing. Thank you so much for listening. I am Dr. Joshua Kolawole. I'm a global transformational leadership trainer. And I hope you listen to more of my videos and you will keep connecting and you will share these videos with your friends and your team and your organization and even your society. Thank you so much. And you can reach me through this contact on the screen. Bye.